The coronation of King Charles is a global spectacle. The eyes of the world will fall on Britain tomorrow and our royal family for all the right reasons. Charles will be the 40th monarch crowned at the mighty Westminster Abbey, which has hosted every coronation since William the Conqueror in 1066. Just think about that for a moment. That's the history of this great country. Well, almost 1,000 years of that history will echo through that great hall as world leaders are gone and millions are glued to screens across the world. The ceremony will feature rings, swords and scepters dating centuries. Charles III will be anointed with holy oil poured from an 800-year-old spoon. He'll ride back to Buckingham Palace in a 260-year-old crown on wheels, the gold state coach, which has dazzled crowds and rattled the teeth of royals since the days of William IV. Frankly, it is what it should be, the stuff of fairy tales. And there can't be a nation anywhere on earth that can rival Britain for this kind of tradition, history, and for celebrating state occasions with pomp, pageantry, and style. That journey from the Abbey to the Palace is just 1.3 miles, but this coronation is, in many ways, the journey of a lifetime. The world has watched Charles as he grew from a grinning child into a loving father and a sometimes cantankerous prince. We speculated for decades about whether the public would embrace his elevation to the crown, about whether he could rise from a shadow of a mother and queen who seemed infallible at times. But now that moment has arrived, and for many people, Charles is not only accepted, but celebrated. For Camilla, the queen and the love of his life, this has been a journey like no other too. She was the outsider, shrouded by the memory of Diana, so often savaged by the media, reviled by many of the public. But tomorrow, she becomes Queen Camilla, and much of the nation has embraced her strength, her wisdom, her empathy, and her just get on with it sense of duty. These are tumultuous times for the monarchy, though. There's no denying that. The end of the Elizabethan age, which spanned changes unprecedented in history, is a major test not just for King Charles, but for the country. Britain's monarchy has faced the scandal of an errant Prince Andrew, an unparalleled hail of poison darts from the rogue royals in Montecito. But it's still here. It's still strong. And tomorrow we'll see again, but it's still bringing us all closer together. In my opinion, the monarchy keeps our sense of nation and patriotism separate from politics. It gives us all a reason to love our country, its traditions and its identity that rises above the fray of the bitterness of everyday debate. There are massive challenges for King Charles, make no mistake about that. Will today's young people embrace the royals? Will the Commonwealth survive? Can an institution built on stoic silence and illogical birthrights survive and thrive in the age of identity politics, populism and a rage against the elites? So yes, there are questions about the very future of the monarchy and there are questions too about Britain's role in the world at this turning point of the eras. But not today. This is King Charles's day tomorrow, and it's Britain's day. There's been a lot of negativity in the build-up to this momentous moment. There always is, the protests, the polls, the tales of an apathetic public. But when it really comes down to it, I think we do love our country, we love our traditions, and we certainly love a good bloody party. But let's do what we do best. Have a cake, have a quiche, wave a flag, raise a pint, and enjoy it. And for everyone else, as my own son observed this week on Twitter, you may not care about the coronation, but I can very much assure you, nobody cares that you don't care. Well, I'm joined now by the royal biographer Tom Bauer, journalist Lynn Barber, and author historian Dr. Tessa Dunlop. Well, welcome to my panel. This is probably the, a the most erudite and secondly the most opinionated panel I've probably ever amassed <laughs> in the history of this great country, which is fitting for what we're about to debate. Tomorrow, Tom, is the only coronation any of us has seen. I was in 1953. I was, I was just going to tee <laughs> you up. I was teeing you both up to see who would jump in. Or a youngster. Of the younger generation, Tom. <laughs> I know that. So, do you have any memories, though? Oh, you? absolutely. You do? What do you Cramp remember about the first well, one? Well, uh, cramped around the tiny screen, 20 people all trying to peer at a black and white image. The TV had just come on. Just come on, and we found someone who had a TV. And it was terribly exciting, yeah. no doubt about it. And, and, and school, Lynn, you, of course. you're the same. Yeah, I, I remember. I, most exciting moment was when um, the peers, peeresses actually, mm. put their uh, crowns on, or what, whatever mm. they're called, coronets, Coronet. and you saw this wonderful flash of white arms mm. from nowhere. It was like the ballet. It was a certain magic. I think yeah. probably because television was black and white, yeah. which I think makes everything look classier. But obviously because also, Tessa, because Queen Elizabeth was 26 years old, 
and beautiful. Yeah. And it was almost like this, ex you know, it's like a Hollywood event of this beautiful young starlet, but, you know, exceeding after the tragedy of her father dying. Charles doesn't have the benefit of any of that. He has multicolour, <laughs> he has social media, he has age not on his side. It's a, it's a tough challenge for him. What's really interesting, I've spoken with a lot of veterans who remember that. I feel faintly ridiculous. I just wanted to try... Well, I wasn't going to mention what you're I doing. I fell in a tiara and she... I feel ridiculous. <laughs> How do they carry it off? I don't know. But anyway, uh, back to the matter at hand. I speak to a lot of veterans and they remember that day and they recall feeling compassion towards Elizabeth. The unimpeachable, a blemish-free young woman, a vulnerability. They went home and prayed for her that night. But bizarrely, I actually think tomorrow, because of his age, because of his checkered past, because of where we're at as a nation and our relationship with the Crown, I think Charles is a hundred times more vulnerable than his mother was 70 years well, ago. Well, I think that's right. And Tom, you know, you've you've monitored the royals now very assiduously for quite some time. It, it does feel like a pivotal moment in the potential future of this monarchy. Well, it does. And the question really is whether Charles can actually build a reign which is separate, obviously, to his mother's, but actually impresses the country and the people and builds a following for the royal family and the monarchy. And that is a huge challenge for him. The, poll, the polls, the most recent polls, show yeah. that there's a lot of support here for Charles, not quite so strong in other parts of the Commonwealth. And I interviewed the Prime Minister of Australia this week, who is a Republican, and made it pretty clear, you know, that they want the end of a British royal as the head of state. Well, they've always said that for years and have managed to uh, reproduce an alternative. Well, Charles actually is not that popular. He's only 54% in the male poll and the monarchy is about Most 70%. politicians would take that. Well, yes, I know, but, I mean, the Queen had over 70%. Yeah, but she 80%. was... A, but look, let's be honest. The Queen, Lynn, was a unique public figure, I think, in modern history. It's hard to think of anyone with her, I think, profound global respect... Yeah. Really, and a sort of untarnished reign in many ways. I mean, to follow that is almost impossible. But the truth, I mean, in theory, I want us to be a republic, but it isn't going to happen, is mm. it? I mean, because how would it happen? Why would you want us to be a republic? Well, I think it's bad to be called subjects. I don't want to be a subject. I don't want to... Well, we've, had to, call, we've had to call Boris Johnson the right honourable gentleman. <laughs> I mean... Oh, uh, yes. Okay. We do use titles for, <laughs> well, we do. for elected officials which make my skin crawl. <laughs> OK. Right? But, yeah, the, just the sort of bowing and scraping and general flunkiness. But, the, the, here's the but. I think the reason for the monarchy, the reason I love the, the idea of it and the fact that we have this royal family, is it's almost unique now in the world. There are other monarchies, but they're not as famous as ours. Yeah. And nobody does pomp, pageantry and ceremony mm. yeah. like the Brits. And I, all my American friends, they'll all be tuning in yeah. tomorrow because they love Tessa, they love uh, the carriages, the coaches, <laughs> they love the military procession. And this one, by the way, this is a staggering statistic. So the procession tomorrow is going to be twice as big as the procession for the Queen's funeral and three times the size of the procession for the Platinum Jubilee, but both of which felt enormous. The truth is, we're papering over our insecurities. I'm sorry. I can't <laughs> properly face down this man, who I don't always agree with. with that. We'll end up having a book Good with Good luck, Queen Camilla, with this on your head. <laughs> um, the truth is, historically, we didn't do pomp and pageantry. We didn't bother with it for Victoria's coronation, for William IV's coronation, when Britannia did controversially and unchallenged rule the waves. When we start getting insecure in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, that's when we muscle up, we refront Buck Pal, we make the mile wider, we get all the music, Elga, tra la la, and then we go for Paris or, later on. Or, it's all about on. Little Britain, look hang at on. us. Actually, actually <laughs> yes. no, because actually, the last coronation came just a few years after Little Britain stood up to Nazi Germany yeah. and saved this country and its freedoms. And I think the pomp, pageantry and ceremony of our great military processions actually emanated from the fact that, yes, when it actually came to it, Little Britain stood up yeah. and punched okay. big bad Hitler in the face right. and saved this country. You so can, I don't agree with you. You can both have. 70 years ago. I'll give you that as a buy. But I would argue that today we don't need... I'm going to go with it because it'll look tragic if we always went droop tomorrow and we'd got everyone out in the horses and carriages <laughs> and there was no one there. But I actually think it's unnecessary. We've had this glut 
of royal events. We've all done very well, fed off the carcass of, of pomp and ceremony. But I actually wonder, how will this be viewed by history? Do you think this will be our last coronation, Tom? No, I don't at all. I think the no, country desperately yeah. needs the monarchy, and I think the monarchy is very important for the country. Yeah, but the coronation really is separate today. from the monarchy, Tom. The question, when you, the Tom, when you, when you defend the monarchy, yeah. what, what, what do you give I us the best justification for it? The alternative is far worse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It'd right. be President Blair or President Prescott right. or, or President Boris Johnson. No, but also... <laughs> You know, when uh, Princess Anne or the king or whoever goes to visit a hospital, a hospice, a school, factory, the people there really welcome them. Yes. As individuals who are sincerely interested in their work and their problems and all the confrontations they have, mm. which a politician will only be interested for their own vote. So I think there's the whole charitable side is brilliant on the monarchy. I think Charles is a very flawed character. Mm. I think he comes to the throne with enormous amount of baggage. But tomorrow is the day, actually, having written a book which is coruscating about him, one's got to put that to a side. One's got to think he now represents an institution, the fate of the monarchy and for King William in the future... And also, in the annals... Uh, ..is very important. Right, and in the annals of King history, he's not that bad. We've had some shockers. <laughs> um, Lynn, let me ask you... The unmentionables, the Montecito rebels, um, Harry and Meghan. Yes. What do you make of them? What, uh, well, should we make anything more of them? Should we just forget about them? I, I think we will increasingly forget about them. Mm. I mean, I think they're, they've peaked, as it were. And I think the king was quite right to invite them. I mean, it would mm. look re really awful if he hadn't. Do we believe that Meghan Markle isn't coming because her son's four that day? Well... <laughs> I mean, I've heard some whoppers in my time from her, but nothing quite as ridiculous as that. Uh, the idea she would give up being at centre stage at a coronation for that is laughable. But it doesn't matter. Well, actually, why but she you... wasn't going to be centre stage. That's why she I think come. that may be why she isn't coming, yeah. Why do you think she's not coming? Though? I think because she knows that... I mean, look, the latest polls show that their popularity is, is at an all-time low. Yeah. That they're right down with Prince Andrew, and there's yeah. a very good likelihood that the British public will boo her pretty loudly. But the truth yeah. is whether she should be there or shouldn't be there or whatever's kept her away, the optics would be better with her there. And on us, I don't being, agree. I don't and on agree. us being platform for the world, tomorrow the eyes are on us. I don't understand, given the soft power that Charles has mm. as king, head of 14 other realms, why are all the composers of the new music British? Why are all the page boys white and English? Why haven't we lent into these relationships sitting on a plate for us still? We just take them for granted. No wonder half of them are pulling away. I think we've dropped the ball there. What do you reckon, Lynn? Well, I didn't know that they were all white. And they I, are. I'm quite surprised. Um, no, I would have thought they, they I'm sorry, all the page they're boys are posh boys. Page boys. Well, yeah. And, and well, all the music, irrelevant. all the new music why is being up, composed Why by bring up it? race? Why well, because they have all days well, bring up race? Because we're talking about Oh, uh, for God's sake, stop the diversity argument today of all days. It's the day before the coronation. It's going to be an extraordinary event celebrating British greatness and history in a thousand years, the diversity argument surely can be silenced no. just today. Absolutely what do we, wrong. What did we... Well, look, I, look I, I think, actually, it's an interesting point. I wasn't aware it was going to be quite as you've depicted. Let's wait and see tomorrow, actually, what we end up seeing. I don't think you can ignore race simply because Meghan and Harry have put race centre stage of their critique about the royal family. And that's made, actually, I think... A lot of countries in the Commonwealth, well, that's right. particularly in the Caribbean, we see, absolutely. really agitated about this notion well, that the royal family are a bunch of racists. Well, that's absolutely right. And that's exactly why I think we should stop today discussing it. Yeah. Because it was Meghan's agenda and she created it. And I think that is untrue. Because if anyone has really hard, worked hard mm. to embrace the, all the different faiths and communities in Britain, it's Charles. I totally agree. He has continuously gone to visit all sorts of places. And the Princess Trust has helped so many... Uh, minorities get on their uh, get on their careers, all the rest of it. So it's just totally unfair, untrue. Will you be watching? Tomorrow? Absolutely. Will you be watching? Oh yes, I will. And even eat, as a Republican, you'll be watching. And eating coronation chicken. But will you be? <laughs> but will you be affirming? That's the question. No. Well, that, will you be will watching? You be? I will be hundred percent watching. Will any of you be saying the oath of allegiance? No, no of course not. No. That's ridiculous. Well, if you... Tom doesn't, I damn well will. He never looks at me, Tom. When we're discussing, don't only look at Piers. I'm here too, by Actually, the way. Actually, he's looking at the person whose show it is. I know yeah. that sometimes, you know, sometimes you get a little confused, Tessa, that you think it's your show and you ask the question. That's an extra. That ain't Tom. how this works. You put your tiara on. Look pretty. Um, Great to see you all. It's going to be an amazing day. I just think we do this stuff better than anybody else. And we'll, I'm sure, rake over the coals of it next week. But for tomorrow, let's just come together and let's celebrate being British at our very best. So thank you to my panel.